Um, I want to have an opening prayer, so would you bow your heads with me, and let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful Sabbath day. We thank you, God, that you are alive and well. You are the sovereign of this planet. We know, God, that you are directing the affairs of this world. Things that are happening here did not take you by surprise. It took us by surprise and how rapidly uh, things are taking place. But you're not caught off guard because you know things from the beginning to the end. So we praise you. We thank you, God, that we can place our utmost trust in you, that this world is not stopping or uh, chaotic because you are absent. We know that you're here. We thank you for that. We thank you for the Sabbath that we can momentarily put all of the news reports aside and we can focus on you and our worship of you and our Lord and Savior Jesus. Lord, I pray that you will bless all of those guests and members who are watching right now from their homes, on their computer screens, television screens, on their phones. I pray, Lord, that your blessing will transmit through these uh, wireless uh, waves and that you will bless all of us. And Lord, I not only pray for our Tempe service today, I want to pray for all of our Adventist churches who are online right now, all over the world. We pray for your rich blessing, which is no less than uh, the fact that we're watching online. Lord, we do pray for this uh, virus pandemic. We pray that it will come to an end. We pray that you will give us compassion, help us to be safe, and please be with those, Lord, who have lost loved ones. Comfort them and be close to them. So bless our uh, message at this time. Give us your Holy Spirit. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, so um, this morning's message is entitled Christ during crisis, Christ during crisis, and I'm going to go ahead and take a seat. By the way, you notice the, the uh, platform behind me. We kind of spiffed it up in preparation for uh, the service, and if you notice behind me, there's some words. I'm going to give this hymnal to my lovely wife here. If you notice behind me, um, <clears throat> there's this word, faith. Uh, and so keep that in mind during all of this. And of course, over here, it is well with my soul. Amen. I hope it is well with your soul. Um, it is well with my soul. And um, we are going to continue to celebrate our Lord's love and guidance and providence and his provisions every single day, no matter what happens. Christ during crisis. I want to share just a very quick experience with you. Some of you have heard this. Some of you have not heard this. Um, years ago, my wife and I um, had foster children. Some of you may have foster children, so um, we identify with those of you who have uh, foster children. Years ago, we had foster children, and we were living in a very small apartment at the time, and the, the state, the social worker, had uh, accepted our limited living conditions. We had three girls plus our own son, and this was in California. Well, the rules state that certain genders and uh, uh, a limited amount of children per room, uh, we, we just could not uh, abide to those rules, and she knew that because we lived in a small apartment. And uh, so it came a point where our lease was going to end and we were looking for a house, a bigger place to live to, in an attempt to comply with the California state laws in regards to foster children. You know, only two max can be in a bedroom. You can't mix a male and a female, that type of thing. And uh, so we didn't renew our lease and for months ahead of time, we were looking for a home. We were looking and looking and looking. We asked church members to help us. Some church members, in fact, offered to open their home to us, but that just wouldn't work out. It wouldn't abide by the state uh, regulations. So we kept on looking left and right in newspapers, and I, um, I think I purchased a list of homes available and then made calls left and right. Nothing was happening. 
absolutely uh, running into a, a dead end all the time. The day came when we had to move from the apartment. We couldn't renew the lease. It had been rented already. The day came that we had to move out. So I picked up a, a U-Haul and uh, had a couple of the youth from our church um, help me load up furniture. And as you know, and back then we had landlines. I know we, landlines still exist, of course, but um, the, one of the last things you do when you move from one place to another is you disconnect your phone. That's the very last thing you do is you disconnect your phone. And so the living room was empty, things were empty, and we were loading up the U-Haul, the phone was still on, and I did not, we did not know where we were going. We had tried everything we could. We had prayed, and we tried everything we could. Members helping us and making calls and leaving messages, et cetera, et cetera. Um, nothing. And I'm leaving out some details, so you might be thinking, well, did you try this? Probably. I'm just trying to cut short my testimony here. We tried everything. We literally did not know we were going, but we had to load up. And all of a sudden, the phone call came. The phone call. The phone rings and I answer it. And he says, uh, are you so-and-so? Yes, I am. Are you still interested in the house? I said, well, which house is this? He described the location of the house. I could not remember leaving a message for this gentleman. I couldn't remember this, this house. I did not remember. I asked, well, it, it's, it's available? He says, well, yes. And I explained my circumstances, um, having my wife, four small children, not knowing where to go. Um, and uh, he said, yes, it's available. So I said, can we come and see it right now? He says, sure, we can, I can be there in about 15 minutes. So we drove about 15, 20 minutes, uh, less than that, and we looked at this home, and it was the perfect home. Now, mind you, before that phone call, um, a couple of weeks and weeks leading up to that day when we had to move, we were stressing out. We were stressing out. I remember parking in a parking lot someplace, and uh, we just didn't know what to do. And uh, my wife started crying, and um, we just held hands, and we started to pray, God, please help us. This was some time before. So we go to the house. This house had the number of bedrooms we needed. This house had a garage I desperately wanted uh, because where the apartment where we were, I had my home office in my garage. No heating, no air conditioning, so I was, it was horrible. Um, the house was beautiful. It lay uh, in the middle of uh, 68 acres of walnut and almond trees. Beautiful, beautiful. I explained the situation to this gentleman that was there, and he said, you know what, forget the credit check. Just give me a check for the first month's rent, and you guys are good to go. And he gave me the keys. We are just praising the Lord. And this is what happened. This is how Jesus provides for us. What he said was that he, was, he came home from a big event, and he called all of the people that had left messages. We were the last on the list, about number 10. Nobody answered the phone except me. Nobody answered the phone except me. And that's how we got this home. And then later, he tells us he was managing the property for these um, out-of-state, the out-of-state owners. We met the owners about a couple of months later, and they said they had been praying for a young couple with children, these were Christians, to rent a home from them. It was just, I have to leave out some details, it was perfect. And so, God understands that we go through stressful times, but he provides for us. Now, let me transition into, let's talk about Jesus a little bit. Did you know that Jesus knows crisis personally? Christ knows crisis personally. I want to share some uh, verses with you. Um, <clears throat> he himself experienced circumstances that were very, very stressful. So let me give you a few examples. In Luke chapter 4, verses 28 and 29. You can write this down at home and then look up the references, uh, look up the passages later. People were, church people, mind you, were wanting to kill him at the very outset of his ministry. For example, the Bible says, all the people in the synagogue were filled with rags 
as they heard these things, and they got up and drove him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill on which their city had been built in order to throw him down the cliff. So I don't know if people have ever, after you, after your life, and wanted to, you know, rub you out, but that could cause a certain amount of, of stress and anxiety. But this is what happened to Jesus. Also, the strong attacks of Satan upon Jesus at his weakest moment, at his weakest moment, um, the temptations when Jesus was alone. In fact, if you think about it, Jesus was alone. If Jesus would have succumbed to these temptations, nobody would have found out, at least immediately. He was all alone. But Jesus maintained his integrity. The book of Matthew chapter 4 says, And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he became hungry and the tempter uh, came to him. His best friend Lazarus had died. And the Bible says that Jesus cried. And his friends were blaming him for the fact that Lazarus had died. Uh, Mary told him, and this is in John chapter 11, Mary told him, Jesus, if you, hadn't, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. If you'd been here. And so they were, they're laying on all of the, uh, trying to make a, put a guilt trip on Jesus himself. And this coming from his best friends that lived in Bethany. I would say that Jesus knows uh, that type of crisis personally. The religious leaders were plotting to kill Jesus when he resurrected Lazarus from the dead. And uh, this was a foolproof uh, evidence that Jesus was the Messiah, and so they wanted to get rid of him. And the Bible actually says this in John 11, verses, uh, verses 5, or verse 5, or excuse me, verse 54, Therefore Jesus no longer continued to walk publicly among the Jews, but went away from there to the country near the wilderness. And so when Jesus uh, got word that, hey, they're, they're after you, they're, they want to kill you, Jesus left. He had to stop his ministry in that particular locale. Um, just a couple more examples. Jesus' last week, he experienced torture, and more troubling was the fact that his disciples abandoned him. In Mark 14, 50, the Bible says, and they all left him and fled. And of course, Jesus tasted death for everybody on the cross. He became sin, even though he did not know sin uh, through experience or through deeds. In fact, he was so much in agony of spirit and, and heart that he, he looks up towards heaven and he says, God, why have you forsaken me? That was probably, uh, and of course, before that, in the Garden of Gethsemane, his, him um, sweating, actually sweating blood. There's a medical, there's a, that was an actual, uh, real medical phenomenon that happens very rarely. But Jesus knows crisis personally. He knows by experience the trials and temptations of humanity. So let me give you two lessons of all of this that I have just uh, shared with you. Lesson number one, Jesus is seasoned in troubles. Jesus is seasoned in troubles. You know, some may say, well, you know, how can Jesus know what I'm going through? How can he possibly know? Or doesn't God know what it's like to etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Jesus is seasoned in troubles. He knows what it is like to live through crisis. In fact, the stress points that he experienced, the temptations, the hardships, surpass anything, I believe, surpass anything by far that we will go through in this life. Um, the, the, the attacks and the pointing of the finger and the abandonment, and the misunderstanding, and the hard hearts that he had to deal with, and of course the persecutions. Nobody has ever experienced um, this duress and stress and um, just suffering that our Lord Jesus has. He was the center of attacks like no other being has ever been in the history of mankind. I strongly believe this. So lesson number one, Jesus is seasoned in troubles. Lesson number two, Jesus is the savior of troubles. Jesus is savior of troubles. That's number two. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean all the time that Jesus will save you out of troubles. Because we all have them, don't we? 
I know, I, if I can see you right now, I know you're nodding your head. We all have those troubles. The best of the best in the Bible experience troubles, persecution, disappointments, um, moments of failure. They've all experienced that. So lesson number two, Jesus is the Savior of troubles. I love this promise in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. Don't you love that? We can come to the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. It doesn't say in time of ease. It says in time of need. We will all experience those times of need and we can come to Jesus with confidence. So troubles may come our way, such as this coronavirus and all the unrest and disturbance that it is leaving in its wake, such as death, obviously, um, financial hardships, physical disconnection, physical disconnection from each other, toilet paper shortages, empty streets, empty pews. <laughs> uh, welcome to the new normal. This is our new normal for, for the time. But Jesus is Savior of troubles. Now, I just shared a few words with you with that, but let me go into that a little bit further because what does that actually mean? Jesus is Savior of our troubles. Well, let me share with you what it does not mean first, and then I'll share with you what it does mean. This is what it doesn't mean. That Jesus will save you when you are a troublemaker. <laughs> when you're a troublemaker, either self-inflicted nonsense or when you spread strife and suffering towards others. Um, now, I get it. Jesus is merciful even when we do cause troubles, you know, and bring them in by our own actions and foolishness into our own lives and then others are affected. And then we ask Jesus to forgive us of our sins. I understand that, Jesus. But um, what I'm talking about is if we are um, troublemakers, I don't believe that we can automatically, by default, expect Jesus to bless and guide us and flood us with the light of his love when we're purposefully being troublemakers. So that's, that's what I mean, and I think we'll all agree with that. So that's what it doesn't mean. It also doesn't mean that we can anticipate Jesus to save us, but we lay dormant and inactive and inoperative. So what do I mean by that? Well, let me give you an example. Moses' mom asked God for help, but what did she do? She weaved a basket together, or at least she got an old laundry basket, and she put baby Moses in there, and she did something about it. She just didn't sit on her hands and wait for God to do something without her action or in the midst of her inactivity. The Israelite army asked God for help, but they had to march Jericho around for a whole week. David asked for help, but he had to go and confront Goliath face to face. In fact, the Bible says that he ran to Goliath. So faith in Christ, faith in God has meat and bones to it. It is a pragmatic faith that is demonstrated by works, not foolish or presumptuous idleness. In fact, James chapter 2 verse 22 says um, that faith is perfected or completed by our works. So this is what um, Jesus saving us from our troubles. This is what it doesn't mean. Here's what it does mean. That Jesus is strong to give us a sense and presence of hope, of peace, of perspective, of keeping our marbles when trials hit. Just keeping our sanity. Even David recognized that we will go through uh, the valley of the shadow of death, but Christ will make us fear no evil, for you are with me. Now, Christ accompanies us through these down times. I think we all know that. Christ is with us. In a, uh, he's our present help in time of need through the trials. But he keeps our faith strong and he keeps our hearts from failing from fear or from abject confusion. So when we experience times of dilemma and difficulty and disturbance and our routines are disturbed and we have to adjust because of the COVID-19, God will help us keep spiritual and mental composure. This is what it means when Jesus is the savior of our troubles. He will help us to keep that composure. But the other meaning of this 
is that Jesus will save us from impending doom. Now, earlier I said, not all the time. I can, always, I can only think of um, those poor martyrs who kept their faith in times of persecution, and uh, yet they were martyred. Um, but this is God's promise that he will save us from impending doom, but it is usually, in fact, always conditioned upon our loving obedience to him. And of course, the classic text to this is Psalm chapter 91. So I want to invite you to open up your Bibles, and I have it right here. Let's, let's read Psalm 91. I want to read a few verses. Psalm chapter 91, starting with verse 1. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Amen? My God in whom I trust. Amen. For it is he who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly, what? Pestilence. That's what it says. He will deliver us from the pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, that's his wings, and under his wings you may seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and bulwark. You will not be afraid of the terror by night or of the arrows that uh, flies, uh, the, the arrow that flies by day, or the pestilence that stalks, stalks in darkness, or of the destruction. The Bible says a thousand, in verse seven, a thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, it shall not approach you. Verse 10 says, no evil will befall you, nor will any plague come near your tent. And then later it says, God will send his angels, Amen. his innumerable angels, to guard you, lest you, and in fact, this is the same verse that uh, Satan tempted Christ with. If you look at um, verse 12, they will bear you up in their hands that you do not strike your foot against, <clears throat> excuse me, against a stone. In other words, they will protect you. So the Bible, um, when Jesus is savior of our troubles, the Bible does say that he will save us from the pestilence, from the plague. So we can bank on that promise. So even though Christ may save us from this pestilence or plague, however, and some Christians are calling this the COVID-19 a plague, this still doesn't mean to be smug about putting faith into practice. That's not what that means. The plague here in Psalm 91, in fact, reminds us of the plague of death on the eve the Israelites were to experience the great exodus from Egyptian slavery. The angel of death came and struck the Egyptians that didn't have faith in God, that did, not, um, uh, that did not submit to his power and his grace after plague after plague after plague revealed to them who the true God really was. Um, that angel of death came and struck them with this plague. But that angel of death, that plague was for everyone. Those that were saved had to do something and loving obedience to God. They had to go and uh, pick up a, a perfect uh, sheep and kill it at twilight and put the blood over their doors. And when that angel of destruction, that plague angel came and saw what they did, the steps they took by faith to save them from this plague of death, they saw that blood that was covering their home, so to speak, because they believed that it would cover them and uh, it passed over the, uh, those homes that had applied that blood. And in fact, I don't have time to go over this, but when we talk about having faith in Christ and believing in Christ, it is not just a mere, um, I believe in Jesus, and yet your hands and your feet and your thoughts and your lips, um, as I said earlier, are inoperative. There are steps to take. We have our human part in loving obedience to Christ. And even, in fact, even before we come to Christ, for those of you who are contemplating on following Jesus and accepting him as Lord and Savior, if you've never done this before, and you may have tuned in at this moment, in fact, 30 seconds ago, and you're hearing me say this right now. Jesus Christ offers his salvation to anyone who believes. This is what John 3, 16 says. Anyone, regardless of what religion you may have in your background, regardless of your gender, regardless of your culture, regardless of who you are, as long as you have red blood flowing through your veins, Jesus offers salvation to you. But there are steps to Christ to take 
if you are to take advantage of this free salvation gift that he offers to you. And that what, some of those steps are repentance, um, admitting to yourself, you do need salvation, and it's not going to originate from inside of you. There is repentance to do, and there is an act of faith. There is a step of faith that you need to take to come to Christ, and that is believing. You may not all have all the I's dotted and the T's crossed and understanding what all the Bible is about, but if you believe that Jesus can save you from your sins, that's a step you need to take uh, to Christ. Um, <clears throat> let me uh, start this transition into the second portion of my message for you, and that is the pandemic that we're all experiencing now. I'm not talking about necessarily the COVID-19. It is wreaking havoc in our society. We need to be careful and we need to be wise. We need to exercise those things that we're told by the experts to do, you know, hand sanitation and staying home if, if sick, it's, it's keeping distance from others, et cetera, et cetera. And a, pan, a, a pandemic like this is going to have its effect on, it's going to play tricks on our mind, on our emotions and our, 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 our thoughts. In fact, it's going to be interesting if this thing rides out for longer. What I am curious about it, how it's going to affect um, our, our minds. Um, it's going to have some type of effect. The fact that we're empty here, that we have to stay at home, that we're disengaged from each other in the physical uh, sense. There's, there's got to be some type of effects of that psychologically. That's what this pandemic is doing. But though COVID-19 should be, you know, respected and not foolheartedly messed with, we need to be aware of an equally dangerous pandemic, albeit in the emotional and spiritual realm, and that is the pandemic of fear. The pandemic of fear. Because of the fear that the coronavirus is, is doing, the, CD, the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, it has some things uh, list some things that can happen. Let me share these with you. Um, fear and worry about your health and the health of your loved ones. Um, I think all of us, my wife and myself, we're always praying. My son, um, he, he works for hospice. He's a CNA for hospice. And so those who are ministering to others, caregivers, um, they can be exposed to this virus. That is going to cause a certain amount of stress, like my wife and I, we're not stressing out, as they say, but we're concerned. We pray for our son. We, we tell him in a non-nagging way, son, please take care of yourself. And he's doing all he can. Um, we're worried about the health of our loved ones, especially those of us who have children. Um, it may cause changes in your sleeping or in your eating patterns, is what the CDC is listing. Difficulty sleeping or concentrating. Um, worsening of chronic health problems. Increased use of alcohol, tobacco, or other drugs. These could be some of the side effects of this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. In fact, let me tell you something that just happened just this last week. My wife and I went to the store, the supermarket, and in some supermarkets, you will see a florist section. They have flowers in the refrigeration and, and the balloons and the flowers. And I intentionally just uh, told myself, go smell the flowers. I did that. And uh, so we were in that section near the produce where the flowers are, and I went and I literally just wanted to take my mind off of this COVID-19. And I literally just started smelling the flowers, and I looked very closely at them intentionally, and it was just admiring the beauty of the flowers. In fact, my wife then joined me, and we were smelling the flowers. She says, look, smell this one. And so we just took a three-minute vacation from COVID-19, and it was a good thing. And then what came to our minds was, of course, what Jesus says, not even Solomon was arrayed like one of these flowers. And so one of the things that we can do to support yourself and to deal with this is to just take a break from all of this and smell the flowers. I was telling somebody the other day, <clears throat> if you're trapped at home and you can't go to work, um, moment, you know, periodically go outside. Go for a walk around the block or just look up in the sky and just thank God and suck in that oxygen and look at the blue sky and the clouds and the sun and get your mind off of these other things. So let me share you some of the things that you can support um, uh, yourself and your family. 
Continue, number one, continue your devotional time with God. Continue your prayers. Continue your Bible reading. We have to be anchored um, in those moments that we spend alone uh, with Christ. The other one, as I just mentioned, is take breaks from watching, reading, or listening to these news stories, including social media, um, and just take a break and focus on something else. If you have a little, if you have puzzles or uh, um, uh, one of those, you have to find the words that are scrambled, uh, I don't know what they call them, crosswords or, or something, just do something. Or for those of you who like to sew, or do, do something to get your mind off of these things. Um, the other thing I want to mention is take care of your body. Take care of your body. Um, many of us are familiar with this acronym New Start. Um, it's eight letters in this word New Start, and it means nutrition. The E stands for exercise. The W stands for water. The S, the first S, stands for sunlight. The, the, the T stands for uh, temperance. The A stands for air. The R stands for rest, and then the, uh, um, the T, the last T starts, uh, um, signifies uh, trust in God. By practicing these things, um, your immune system will, will boost itself, and you will be less susceptible to catching any virus or anything because your immune system <coughs> is strong because of the lifestyle that you're adapting, uh, these eight healthy uh, habits that you can do for your own life. Um, make time to unwind, do other activities, connect with others, talk with people, call them on the phone. And last what I have here is have an attitude of gratitude. Thank God every day for living, for salvation, for the things that he has given you, for the blessings that he pours out on you. Have this attitude of gratitude. For those of you who have children, um, and looking up various sources uh, this week, children and teens react in part from how they see adults reacting around them. Um, sometimes we, you know, we just give them the lead and they respond uh, appropriately. So when parents and caregivers deal with COVID-19 calmly and confidently, um, you can provide the best support in that way for your children. Um, we as parents can be m more reassuring to those around our, uh, f around our children. And so it's good to inform ourselves, but not to um, behave and speak in a way that our children are seeing panic and anxiety in us as parents. Not all children or teens are going to respond the same way uh, to stress, obviously. Um, but here's some common changes to watch for. And I don't remember what website I got this from, but I thought this is pretty good stuff. Here's some uh, changes um, uh, to watch out for. If your children, of course, depending on their age and of course their individual makeup, excessive crying or irritation in younger children. Um, you know, mommy, what's this virus? And they may get all stressed out because you're stressed out. But um, it's, if there's excessive crying, returning to behaviors they have outgrown, for example, toileting accidents or, or bedwetting, that may be a sign that your children are under this, uh, going through this duress. Excessive worry or sadness, unhealthy eating or sleeping habits, irritability and acting out behaviors in teens, um, poor school performance, of course, many of the schools are closed now, um, difficulty with attention and concentration. I can just hear some of you parents saying, well, that's my teen anyways. <laughs> but that may be on the increase. Um, unexplained headaches or body pain, use of alcohol, tobacco, or drugs. Um, just keep an eye on your children. and There's ways that you can support them. Um, take time to talk with them, uh, with your teens about this outbreak. Read the Bible together and pray together as a family. Um, I'm thinking in our, in our very own church, um, we have families with uh, multiple children, and um, you know, read together and pray together. Reassure your child or teen that they are safe. Let them know that it is okay if they feel upset. Talk things out. Don't just scold them and say, oh, be quiet, it's nothing. Um, listen to them and talk, uh, talk to them. And be a role model. Take breaks, get plenty of sleep, exercise, eat well, connect with your friends and family members. Be a role model for your children at home during this time of crisis. Again, if this prolongs and we just don't know, there's lots of things that are unknowns, 
But if this prolongs, um, again, as I said, for now, this is our new normal. And so we're going to have to adjust um, our daily activities and we're going to have to really keep a guard on our thoughts and how we're handling these things as Christians. Um, we're going to be posting on our website um, a PDF that has um, six promises. We made them available here in our very own foyer just last week when, you, when we had our service. Six amazing promises of God of how to uh, keep you buoyed up through this crisis. But we're going to be posting those on our website very, very soon. My title this morning, let me come to a close, is Christ in Crisis. I want to encourage you that are listening um, to keep hope in God, keep faith in God. Um, we are human beings. We are naturally uh, we naturally can fall into anxiety and stress and, and worry. Um, these are the things that we have to live with and cope and manage. And by faith and trusting in God, while we are not, uh, you know, stagnant in our own works, but we're doing what we can, then leave the rest to God. Keep faith in God. And that'll give you strength. That'll give you strength in your mind. That'll give you strength in your spirit and your heart. Uh, during this COVID-19 crisis. The, um, the series that I'm preaching again is called These Empty Pews Are Full. Now, let me tell you why I'm saying that. There's only three people besides our camera guys. There's only three people in the sanctuary right now. But if as believers, as Christians, as those who love the Lord with all of our hearts and we're praying and depending on Jesus and uh, during these times, you're actually filling yourself up. We're praying for the Holy Spirit every day. And even though I'm preaching to empty pews, I know you're out there. I know you're listening to me. I know that you can be full of God's grace, full of his presence, full of the peace that he gives to us, even a peace that surpasses all understanding, Philippians chapter 4 tells us. If we give all of our anxieties and if we unload and vent on our Lord Jesus Christ in faith and in trust, he will put that peace in our hearts that the world cannot give you, but that only Jesus can give you. And in that sense, even though you're here and the pew is empty where you usually sit, you can be full of his grace and his presence. So I invite you to always trust in him. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you so very much for being the Christ in this crisis. We pray, God, and I pray for everyone who is watching and listening to me right now that you will grace them with your loving and powerful presence, that you will provide for our needs when there's lots of shelves that are empty in the grocery stores, that you provide for our needs. And not only that, Lord, but we know from your word that those of us who have plenty, we are obligated to share with those who have less. This is our privilege to be generous and benevolent with the goods that we have. So give us a compassionate heart. We not only want to pray for others in need, but if we can help supply those needs, Lord, then by your grace, we want to take action. Lord Jesus, no matter if a church is full or empty, as many of our churches worldwide, we know, Jesus, that nothing can keep you from ministering to us, for providing for us, for giving us power and direction and guidance. We thank you for this, Jesus. Continue to be the Christ in this crisis for us. For we ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, may God bless you and keep you. And we'll see you um, on Tuesday night. If you go to our website, tempeadventist.com, under the announcement section, click on that Tuesday and Friday subtitle, and it'll give you instructions on how to Zoom. I'll be just right from my own home. And so we'll see you on, we'll see you on Zoom Tuesday at 7 o'clock, and then Friday at 7 o'clock, same time, 
And then, of course, next Sabbath for our online streaming uh, like we're doing this morning. God bless you and have a happy Sabbath.